Hello everyone. Welcome to ESGI's webinar series. Today's topic is Social Emotional Classroom Ideas. I'm Rochelle and I'm excited to be your host for today's webinar featuring Allison Hogan. We'll get started with Allison's presentation in just a moment, but first we have a few housekeeping details for you. Let's look at the webinar tips. For better audio and video quality, close other applications like Skype that use bandwidth. If you are having any audio or video issues, try refreshing or changing your browser. Today we will be using the question feature since everyone is muted during the webinar. If you have a question, type it in the box. Let's practice now. Everyone, find the question box and type in the number to represent how many times you have attended an ESGI webinar. If it's your first one, please put one. Great, it looks like we have many new people as well as some returning visitors to the ESGI webinar series. Today you will receive a certificate of attendance for joining us live and that certificate will be emailed to you within two days. So check your inbox. That email will also contain a link to today's broadcast as well as a link to Allison's PowerPoint that she will be using for her presentation. Now for the prizes. Five lucky winners will get a one-year ESGI license. There is no need to register as the winner will be chosen from the live participants, but make sure you stay on until the end to hear the winners announced. We at ESGI are thrilled that so many of you have registered to learn with Allison today. Thanks for all, you, all of you who are dedicated to helping children and families. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Allison and you will get to see her live on the webcam and let the learning begin. Hi, good evening. My name is Allison Hogan. I am delighted to be with you and share with you my journey on social and emotional learning. I am thrilled that you're here with me. I'm on the edge of going to my sixth conference with a nonprofit here in Dallas called the Momentus Institute. And the Momentus Institute is a nonprofit in Dallas that is also a school but helps to raise awareness on social and emotional learning. Their conference has been going on for six years. They've been every year and this journey started with them. I went and saw their school. It was initially a lab school where they took children from high poverty trauma areas and they learned a great deal about using whole child education to help them. Um, my master's degree is in reading and English as a second language and I've always noted when I worked with students that they've had some anxiety, they've had some stress, and the younger I work with students, I've noticed some parent um, or family separation anxiety, and I want to help these students. Um, you can follow me online on Instagram, on Twitter, at AllisonHoganEDU, and I'm thrilled to be sharing with you what I've done in my journey and what I'm doing currently in pre-K. This is my second year at the Hockaday School teaching pre-K, and I absolutely love this age because these students are like sponges on what we do. So I'm going to let the journey begin with you on how I learned about social and emotional learning and hopefully we can get some conversation going. So what does it mean when we say we teach the whole child? And I mentioned this earlier. Um, we have an increased point scale in social competency and this is from Upwork.com and it shows when we teach the whole child that 54% um, of students are more likely to earn a high school diploma, twice as likely to graduate with a college degree, and 46 more likely to have a stable full-time job at 25 when we teach social, emotional, and academic skills. I will, I will say initially when I did my teaching prep programs, they focused very much on academics and not so much on that psychology. I had one psychology class that talked about, you know, age developmental and didn't really get into the nitty gritty of what's expected when they're four, what's expected when they're five, what about emotions and feelings. And so I was so glad when I found the Momentous Institute in Dallas, Texas, because they were able to clearly articulate 
why, why it's important to talk about emotions and feelings, and I'm going to convey that to you today. So where did I begin? Um, I already kind of gave you a little bit uh, nugget on this. I began at the Momentous Institute, and they have a great model on social and emotional health. And I'm sorry, this image is a little blurry. I worked on it today with my tech director. But the core of anything, any good teaching, any good relationship starts with safe relationships. And the Momentous Institute does a fabulous job at the beginning of year of laying the groundwork. They are very intentional with doing home visits where um, they go to the homes of their students and meet the families. They see where their kids are from and they start to develop those relationships before the first day of school. I don't have the luxury of going to the homes of my students. So what I do is I set new student family meetings and I ask that in these meetings and they're just about 15 minutes that they bring in the student before class starts, usually during that pre-planning time as teachers. And I ask the family some questions. I watch the child and the child will, will play and I'll give the child some manipulatives to play. But I'm very intentional in the questions that I ask my families in that initial new, new family meeting. I will ask, um, does, is your child a good eater? What do they eat? Um, yes, I ask the allergy questions that are very basic. I also want to know um, what the family is like. Is there a mom? Is there a dad or grandparents raising this child? And then with that safe relationship, I'm able to really connect the dots with the students before they even walk in the door of my classroom. Um, from there, the minute I get them, I'm talking about self-regulation, how it's, how it's normal to feel anxious on the first day of school, how you might feel scared and worried if you're in a new environment. And so I'm going to walk you through um, some of my favorite tools that I use in my classroom to help students self-regulate because students are going to be places in my classroom, outside at recess, maybe away um, at home with with mom or dad not being there or grandparents not being there. So how can they use self-regulation tools um, when they're not with me? And then from there, I just go up the stairs just like Momentus does where we have awareness of self, where we're talking about gratitude and we're doing some brain talk. And then we do understanding of others where we're developing empathy. And at this age where I teach in pre-K, empathy is really hard to teach, but we still have some great conversations about it. And I'm not expecting mastery at any point with these students. It's more of an introduction. It's more of a conversation and it's an ongoing conversation. And that, that is the real key. Um, and then we do some integrated influences, which is at the very top. And I still do some of this, even though I'm in pre-K. We do some acts of kindness. We do the Great Kindness Challenge in January where students will perform acts of kindness and we talk about who feels better receiving those acts of kindness us giving the acts of kindness or the people receiving the acts of kindness and you're going to say in pre-k what can these students do these students in pre-k do amazing things they um cut hearts and deliver them to one classroom they um one of them said, well, can we thank our cafeteria workers? Absolutely. So we just got butcher paper and said, well, what, what do you think we can write on it? And so that became a shared writing where we wrote thank you and then delivered it to the cafeteria workers and hung it in the cafeteria. So it's just being really intentional, listening to our students and talking about how we can cultivate this shared sense of gratitude and kindness. And it's, again, it's not mastery. It's an ongoing conversation. Um, so I'm going to walk you through this. Momentous is great to follow online, and they have a blog that you can read about, and most of the things I'm going to mention are much more in detail on their blog, and I highly encourage you to go check out the Momentous Institute blog. So I shared with um, my faculty at the Hockaday School at the beginning of the year this quote by Brene, Brene Brown, who is one of my favorite um, authors on nonfiction text, and she talks about how you can live courageously or you can live comfortably. We cannot choose both. I'm going to tell you this journey on social and emotional learning. It's going to challenge you and it's not going to be comfortable at times and you're going to have to be courageous. And I'm going to tell you, we expect our students to be courageous in trying new things and we as teachers have to be learners as well and be courageous. And I'm going to tell you this journey for me on social and emotional learning and doing some of the things I'm going to share with you. I had to be very courageous because I wasn't comfortable myself doing them. And I let my students know that, that I was experiencing a little bit of uncomfortableness and I, I want them to know that so that they know that it's okay to feel that way. Um, everything, in, and this is a, a quote I use often with them, is not always rainbows and sunshine. So this is great and I'm gonna refer to this often. So this is Faith from the Momentous Institute, and it all starts, this, this awareness of social and emotional learning starts with the breath, with the breathing. And the reason why is when our breath is very heavy after a, a run or after an anxiety, our heart is beating faster, our heart rate is increasing, and it's getting, our breath is a lot faster. And we have to teach students to tune into their breath. And we've, we've been told, our students have been told, calm down, but have we told these sweet babies how to calm down? 
most likely they've never been taught how to calm down. They've been told to calm down, but they've never been taught. And so we're going to teach them how do we calm down and what does that look like? And this is the self-regulation. So what Faith has in her hand there is a Hoverman sphere. And um, I just introduced this this week to my students and we take our Hoverman sphere and, and I do this with them and we just breathe in and then breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. And, and Faith talks about using this and there's a video on YouTube. You can look up Faith and the Hoverman sphere on YouTube and Faith, did it. And if you follow, if you see me on Twitter, this is one of the things that I tweeted out. My students watching Faith and Faith showed them, Faith is in kindergarten, Faith showed them how to use the Hoverman sphere. This is a class favorite. Um, I will say a lot of my students are dying to get their hands on this. They come in, they're like, I miss my mommy, I miss my daddy, I'm worried, I'm scared. And so I'll say, okay, what can you do to help yourself? Again, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna tell them, I'm gonna guide them. What do you, what can you do? Go to the calm down basket and I'm gonna talk about that. But this is one of the, one of the things in our calm down basket. Uh, we have to have students have an awareness of their breath and breathing. And so again, we use this Hoverman sphere to show what is happening in our bodies to help them understand with that. Um, how I do my breathing is structured in three times. And I'm going to say today is a day that I did it a lot more than three times. It was just a really interesting day in my classroom. But I do it at the start of my day after my students arrive. And we um, do some different things for breathing. I'm going to show you that. We do it after our recess time because we come in kind of excited from recess. And we do it before we go home. And before we go home because we're often very excited to go home. And so I want us to be on the same page. And that's exactly why we do it before dismissal. Again, today I did it a lot more times than three. We um, came back from an all school gathering and we're very excited, so we did it then. We, before we did some rotations in the afternoon, I said, okay, well, come on, let's get together, and we just calmed down. I use a basic chime that I ring, and I ring it once to start it, and I'll do three deep breaths, and I want the students to hear me, and so I'll just breathe in, and at a kind of slower pace, and I'll breathe out. I'll breathe in and I'll breathe out. I'll breathe in and I'll breathe out. And then I'll ring the chime at the end to close it. Now, some people are not comfortable with this, and so I'm going to give you some other resources to show what you can do if you're not comfortable with the chime. Um, your students might feel a little awkward, and it's okay to acknowledge that. I don't have students close their eyes. I give them the option. I say before I start, I said, I want you to look down or close your eyes. And why, why might I? ask them not to close their eyes because some students have experienced trauma and closing their eyes could reflect some or bring up some negative emotions for them. And I want them to have the choice of looking down or closing their eyes. It's really important. And I ring that chime. We just breathe in, breathe out. That's it. We close it. It takes about 10 seconds and that's and that's it. And, and usually we might talk about how do you feel after this? And we did this in our all school gathering today and two of my former students um, that are now in kindergarten said, I feel better, I feel calm. And that's what we want them to feel. We want them to feel safe. So really in these in these two pieces of breathing, those first two steps in momentous talk about, you know, safe relationships and self-regulation. We're doing those two things by doing the simple breathing exercise. So I get it. Some of you are like, chime, no way, not for me. And so I got I got you some options. So that that is a picture of the chime that I do use. And um, this is when I taught a K1 bridge class. Um, had a very active class, uh, mostly boys that year, and we gave them Beanie Babies and had the Beanie Babies rise, watch them rise and fall. So they had a specific task that they had to do with their breathing. This was very good for my active learners because I said, what, what, are, what are some things that you notice about this? And they said, when our Beanie Babies go up and down fast, that means our heart is fast and we're breathing harder. And I said, okay, and what do you notice about when we're going slow? We're calmer. Um, they're going at a slower pace, and so I'm making them realize their connection. This was really good. Um, I've seen some exercises recently where people have students listen to the chime, so it's a little mindful listening. So um, I want you to listen to the listen for the chime. Raise your hand when you hear the chime end, and by giving them some intention, it keeps maybe your students who maybe get bored or a little anxious or need something to do. It gives them a task-oriented thing. The Beanie Babies also help with that task. But breath is the basic practice of that safe relationship and, again, that, that self-regulation.
So it's still not feeling comfortable with maybe the Beanie Baby or the Chime. Don't worry, I got some great websites for you. Um, one of them is Cosmic Kids Yoga. This is on YouTube, free resource. You can go to Cosmic Kids. They have stories, so they have some nice, fast yoga movement breathing exercises, or they have some short, like good two, two and a half minute ones that you can show if you have a display image. Go Noodle, I know a lot of teachers use Go Noodle, fabulous resource free as well. Have some flow activities where you can bring it down, turn it on and off, and we will, we will substitute these for our breathing activities. Again, you don't have to have technology. You can do the chime, you can do the beanie babies. I had my guidance counselor um, last year have the students put books on their belly and watch the books rise and fall. So it's just being resourceful and using whatever is around you to help you establish that breath. Now there are two apps that were developed by Momentus. One of them is Breathing Bubbles. And you can have students, after you show them how to use it, you can have them utilize this. Um, breathing Bubbles has them release a worry or maybe a frustration, or it could also be an excitement that they're experiencing, and they breathe as that bubble fades away. This is a great connection to actually physically breathing bubbles. And if you've ever had students blow bubbles, um, you could have them connect that to a past experience. And then this is Settle Your Glitter, which um, a lot of you have seen glitter jars online, maybe through Facebook um, ads or with other websites. Settle Your Glitter is, um, we have a glitter ball in our class, and this is, um, got this from Momentus, and they worked with a psychologist to get this. And really what they say is when we're frustrated, angry, or upset, our mind is like, our brain is like this ball. And if we have the glitter everywhere, we cannot make a good conscious decision. And oftentimes when we're frustrated or angry and our brain is like this glitter floating everywhere, it's, it's not, the words that we say are not the best. The intentions that we have are not really clear. And so settle your glitter, has students breathe until that glitter is settled mostly. And the, the Settle Your Glitter app allows them to do that. Now, I love technology, but the physical kinesthetic part of holding this glitter ball is a lot more impactful for my students than using the app. The app is just a great add-on bonus feature, and you can use it. Both apps are free, no cost associated with them. For my parents that maybe don't have the resources, um, they, they often put this on their cell phone because they often carry their cell phone and if their child gets upset or frustrated, they have something they can go to or a tool their child can use and, they, and, and I've gotten a great feedback with it. So these are just some breathing alternatives that you can do. Again, you're going to feel uncomfortable. I want you to live courageously and, and try one of these with your students. I literally came off the Momentus Institute my first year, went in my classroom Monday, the conference ended on Friday, went in Monday and said, okay, I'm going to start this breathing. I'm going to do it three times a day. I'm going to be very I'm going to do it with fidelity for a week and see if I notice any difference. And I did. I noticed a huge difference in my students. I continued it all year. And um, I wrote a blog post for independent schools when I was doing this. And I said, what I realized is that before our class play, I heard students telling each other, echoing in the hallway, it's okay. We can just breathe and we'll be okay. And they were doing it without me even telling them. So, you know, don't just give it a week. Don't just give it two weeks. Give it some time and see if you see students utilizing it. I think you'll be really surprised um, the fact that they are using it too. So it's just being repetitive. That is a good thing, changing it up. So maybe you do the chime for a week. Maybe you go to something else so that there's a little bit of novelty. Um, being very intentional, I will say we got, we are partnering with our Dallas Yoga Center this year at Hockaday and doing some mindfulness and breathing activities, utilizing the tools in your classroom. So partner up with a buddy class. So um, we use fourth grade lunch buddies at Hockaday and my pre-K students are going to go to see their fourth grade buddies and learn how they use a different bowl chime to see how they do their breathing exercises. And so we were very intentional with using a space where we already created partnerships or buddies in a school and having the older girls teach the younger ones and the fourth grade teacher that I'm working with says I'm super excited because I wasn't sure how I'm going to get this across to my students but the fact that they have an authentic audience to work for it's really going to help them with learning the skill and learning how to use it so don't be afraid to partner up with another class in your building to say hey let's do this together or maybe your older ones teach my younger ones so Again, be really resourceful with using the resources around you. Big fan of that. It's always better to do with, that, with someone else too. So uh, I saw a lot of questions on, what do you use for curriculum? Tell me about this. So Momentus Institute pointed me to Mind Up curriculum that's developed by Goldie Hawn and some Stanford psychologists. There are three books on Mind Up. 
Mind Up is going to teach you about breathing, about the brain, and then some mindful smelling, mindful tasting activities. Um, they teach them about the parts of the brain, and that's really impactful because it tells students what's happening in their sweet little brains when they get upset, when they get frustrated, what that amygdala is doing, what the hippocampus does. And again, not expecting mastery as a conversation. And the more that we talk about it, the more we highlight students that are using it, the more that it can catches on. Um, Mind Up is offered in K2, and that's the K2 version you see on your screen. Um, it is offered in 3, 5, and 6, 8. What I did was I went on Scholastic, used my bonus points as a resourceful teacher, and just got my Mind Up curriculum and started teaching it and had a great time doing that. We are utilizing it, uh, I've utilized it every year, and my Dallas Yoga Partnership this year with my school is also utilizing Mind Up curriculum. Um, one of the, the must-have books, if you have not heard of Yardsticks by Chip Wood, it is an amazing must-have. It gives milestones, and I want to be cautious here. It is not a checklist. I'm not going to ever go to a parent and say, your child and your child's four years old and they're not, they're not doing this, or they're five years old and they're not doing this. It is mainly an observational list for you to see where are your students falling? So what I do in my pre-K conferences is I copy four-year-olds in the fall and give it to give them to parents in the fall. And I and if they're turning five, I might give them the five. But I usually give the five in the spring and maybe the six. And I have some conversation of here are some social areas that we're working on. Here are some developmental areas we're working on. Yardsticks has just been a lifesaver for me, especially when I was teaching that bridge class between K and one. And really for parents, for me, it's an affirmation. Um, I had a parent last year share with me, and I know you'll laugh at this. When students turn five, they can be known to fall out of chairs. Kid you not, the parent was super, <laughs> super relieved. She's like, my daughter does this all the time. They fall sideways out of chairs because their bodies are still developing that core strength to sit in chairs. They just don't quite have it yet. And so it really just is a great conversational piece. It's a great piece for administrators, for teachers, for parents. And I really just find it's, it's a huge affirmation that yes, we're on the right track or we're working towards these goals. Um, one of my mentors in the field of education is Christy Moraz. She has done a ton. She does a great blog on kindergartner uh, confidentiality and has a mindset for learning that she's published. She has some other books on smarter charts, but really this book does a fabulous job of tying in how we can teach this in the classroom. And this is not an add-on. And I have a, um, an interesting point where it's not an add-in as much as it is a fold-in because you're already doing this. It's how do we highlight it? And Christy does a great job of doing that. She focuses on five pieces. And I'm gonna show you this here. Optimism, persistence, flexibility, resilience, and empathy. And she has conversations about them. She uses kid-friendly images when she introduces them. And I love the persistence where the stop sign is and the line is drawn through it. That is one thing that I focus on with my students, and that's one of our values. And we divide, we would take these values, if you will, and divide them up as grade levels in our school. So pre-K might take perseverance because a lot of times when we enter pre-K, it's, I can't do this, I need help. And so we want to at least get them to attempt to do things. And so we've come up with some nice common language for our co-curricular teachers or anyone that has interactions with our pre-K students. We want them to try at least three times before they ask for help um, from an adult. And so they might try, they might try again, they might ask a friend, but then we ask them each time, have you asked three times before you ask for help? They might be tying a shoe because we want to grow independent learners. And so pre-K, it's persistence. Now, it doesn't mean when I divide these up among grade levels that I can't talk about them. I'm going to embrace the opportunities for sure. But kindergarten might be flexibility, and first grade might be resilience, and second grade might be empathy, and third grade might be optimism. And we just chant very, we have all school gatherings, we chant just a simple phrase, each grade level does. So for persistence, uh, today, we, today we had our art school gathering, our pre-K students, they said pre-K, persistence, and then they said, we keep trying. And very simple, they love it, and, you know, for empathy, I understand you, very short taglines, and it's repeated every all school gathering or every morning meeting in our classroom. We have conversations about it, very deliberate about it, and it's just a really good language, core values that we want in our learners. So Mindset for Learning, definitely check it out if you don't know that text. 
So these are some of the anchor charts that Christy has in her book that I've utilized in my own classroom. So she first talks about some self-control strategies. So how do we do that self-regulation? And she has students, and I'm going to talk about this one here um, on self-control strategies first, and then I'll go to self-talk. Um, for self-control strategies, we're going to look at the, the dots, and specifically, she has students go around, take their other hand, and go around in a circle and press their hand into their other hand and do dots. And that your students that need to touch or feel, they always have their hands with them and they can do the dots to help them calm down and focus. When we say run, you'll see some clear parameters. We don't want any wonders. We might say run in place. We might give them two lines. If you have one that needs to move, that needs to go back and forth, absolutely. But running is an option. And then we have bubbles and that's where we use the um, blow your bubbles app or we can say you're going to pretend to blow bubbles. I saw one recently where it was hot chocolate breaths. Pretend you're holding hot chocolate and you're going to blow it off. And that is getting that self-regulation going on, that, that blowing. Um, oftentimes when we give students independent work, we hear that negative self-talk come out. I can't do this. And so you know, they might try some self-regulation strategies, but we're also going to embrace that about doing some positive self-talk. And you're going to say, when, Allison, am I going to do this on my schedule? This is a great opportunity in your closing of your lessons, maybe a midpoint a mid teaching lesson where you say, all right, first you're going to say your name, then you're going to take a deep breath, and then you're going to think about maybe what you can do differently. If you can't write that letter K, what can you do differently? And then you're going to say it back to yourself, and then you're going to be kind. We've got to teach these sweet ones how to do this. They've never been taught usually how to have this positive self-talk. Um, it's really important that we just embrace opportunities. Again, don't add it on. When you see that student tomorrow in your class that can't write the number seven right, you're going to embrace that as an opportunity. I notice you're trying really hard. Can I teach you something really quick? And most likely they will agree and say, first, I want you to say your name. Okay, so I'm going to say Allison, and then I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to think about how that eight goes. I'm going to visualize it. I'm going to say it. Okay, I'm going to make it S, and then I'm going to go all the way back up to the top, and I'm going to give it a try. And I might even number, I might, I'm a big finger, touch, tone, touch tones person, or I might say, first, I want you to say your name. Second, I want you to take a deep breath. Third, I want you to think about it. Fourth, I'm going to have you say it back to yourself. And fifth, I want you to be kind. I'm going to have the student touch their fingers and do it as well so they remember the steps. And I might have that student, if they're comfortable, sharing at the closing of my lesson what they did to help them. Because to me, that's where the the weight is in gold is those students that have the problem that work through it and celebrating them. Yes, I want to highlight the students that are doing the skill I'm working on, but it's those ones that troubleshoot and that's the skill. It's the grit skill and that's the important piece of Angela Duckworth that she talks about in her book Grit. Fabulous book too to check out um, that you can see. So those are just some anchor charts and these are anchor charts that won't ever go old. I don't Move these, they will stay up in the classroom all year once we make them because I'm going to refer back to them. I'm going to highlight students that are doing them. So if you have not, start talking about emotions with your students. And I did a little bit in that with the last piece. And you're going to say, when can I do this? Um, really, there are some fabulous resources and um, you're going to have some conflict in your class. I have it all the time at recess where she's not playing with me or we were playing something and somebody came along and took my friend away. And so one of the things that we learned from Rosetta Lee recently um, on inclusion and diversity was bugs and wishes. This was great for our early childhood learners because oftentimes they get this. And, and for those of you that teach older students, this would be your I statement. And so um, what we have students say is it bugs me. And we first we got to talk about well, what bugs you and we had them share. It bugs me when my brother pulls my hair. It bugs me when mommy doesn't kiss me goodnight. It bugs me when um, my sister shuts the door in my face. And so we had them share what bugs them first, and then we had them tie that into a wish. What would you like them to do instead? And so we had them do a couple scenarios together where they talked to a partner, but then that day on the playground, we had to model it a lot as teachers. When the students would come to us and say, we were playing on the swings and then my friend went to play family. And I said, 
have you had that, have you told her it bugged you? No. And so I would go up with the student and say, let's tell Susie, it bugs me when you go play something else. And I wish you would let me know when you go play something else because I want to play with you. So bugs and wishes would be mainly for my primary learners, early childhood, and then a statement, I don't like it when you, and it makes me feel, so there's that kind of empathy piece, and I wish you would. So there's a third step with that I statement. I don't like it when you, it makes me feel, and I wish you would. Um, I was a former coach with Girls in the Run, and that curriculum with Girls in the Run ties in dealing with some of this conflict resolution. You're going to model this a ton um, with your students. You're going to do some guided practice with it, maybe on the playground, maybe at lunch. Also use it on your students. Maybe you have a classroom management issue. And a great time. So today, it bugs me when you aren't raising your hands because I can't hear you speak and I wish you would raise your hands to speak because then we can have more of a conversation. So use it on your students as well. It's really helpful. Um, another one of my favorite, favorite resources is Class Dojo. I used to use Class Dojo for behavior management and now have strictly just gone to their Big Ideas series. Class Dojo has a whole list of these social and emotional skills. And they started probably about three years ago on this journey. They partnered with Stanford and Yale and Harvard and developed with, with professors there some really short videos, two, two and a half minutes long, some are three, three and a half minutes, where you meet Mojo. And that's Mojo, the little green monster with the bandana tied to him. And he has a beast. And the beast is those emotions. And so in this episode of mindfulness, Mojo is going to make a class presentation. And he's getting, he, he is so excited. He's prepared. He's got his costume on. He gets up there and he freezes. Like, my hands are sweaty. I'm stuttering. I practiced this. I knew it. He gets back to his seat. He feels so frustrated with himself. And his friend goes, it's the beast. Beast has gotten a hold of you. And so in a series of three episodes, and I don't watch them all in one day, I do it in my morning meeting, maybe once one day, give it a day to sink in and then do it another day or even give it a week, depending on your schedule. But with the Big Idea series, again, free, you can watch the video. They have discussion questions afterwards, but I'm very intentional. And here's where I do something a little different. Whatever you're communicating with your families, newsletter, um, remind, seesaw, um, if you're using Class Dojo portfolios, if you have a Facebook account, I take this link, send it to parents, even old fashioned email with the discussion question. And I'll say, start a conversation tonight, maybe on the way home. Um, watch the video, and maybe you're going to talk about a time you felt like Mojo or what you did to get past your beast. I take the same questions that we use, it's already all there, copy and paste it, and send it home because I want these families to continue the conversation. Education is a partnership, and I let parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles know up front, I want you involved in your child's education. And by sending these messages, it lets them know, kind of to be a fly in the, like they're a fly in the classroom, but how to, how to do it. Because oftentimes, the parents that we have just don't know what to do, don't know how to have these conversations. And this is giving them the tools to do it. It's giving them the questions, it's letting them know what the child watched, and in Class Dojo, very friendly, you could do this. I'm doing this in pre-K, you can do it all the way to fifth grade. When we had the Bugs and Wishes speaker, Rosetta Lee, we sent this specific beast series to all of our classrooms, pre-K through four, or pre-K through four in our lower school. We sent it to them to watch and ask those discussion questions as part of their morning meeting and got you know good feedback from teachers and families that hey, this is this is a very common thing that we're dealing with and we appreciate getting questions to ask for how we could fix it. So um, one of the first years I attended Momentus, I learned about the Calm Down Basket, and those are my sweet students on the right there utilizing Calm Down Basket items. So my Calm Down Basket is starts at the beginning of the year, empty, green, um, it does say Calm Down Basket. I got mine from Momentus Institute at their conference, but you could use anything you had. I don't feel like you have to go and buy anything. And I have students pass it around at the beginning of the year in our morning meeting. And I'll say, I'm gonna teach you some things to calm yourself down with this year, and this is our calm down basket. And you might use it when you're upset, when you're anxious, when you're worried, when you're excited. And I'm very deliberate. So this nice basket that you see all of these things in, it does not start like that. It starts empty. And it's really important to start empty. I introduce one item at a time. And what I mean by at a time, I do one a week. And the first one I start with is just a very simple, small stress ball. A calm down basket is full of items to help a child manage difficult feelings. It could be a stress ball, a silly putty, a kaleidoscope, 
Kids' behavior is often a call for skill building and helping them to identify when they need to use tools to calm down is an important skill. It's going back to that self-regulation. Um, on my Mondays and morning meeting, I do something called lightning round. And what I do in lightning round is students have 20 to 30 seconds to tell me about something they did over the weekend or something they're looking forward to because not everyone has had a happy weekend. And so maybe they're looking forward to computer class. Maybe they're looking forward to playing with their friends at recess that day. The person that is speaking has the new calm down basket item because I want them all to feel it. I want them all to squeeze it. I want this novelty to wear off because I don't want them to play with it. And we, they, the person that's talking has it. Um, if my, if I'm a long-winded speaker, I set a visual timer for 30 seconds. When the timer goes off, they know they have to pass the item. So one week we have this. One week I introduce the glitter ball. So then I have two items in the calm down basket. For my tactile kids, I might do a brush, nice dollar store brush there. That's a ladybug. For the people that need to feel, um, my Hoverman sphere, I just introduced this week. This is the hot commodity in the hot come down basket. And um, again, just breathing in and out, I model how to use this. Even a pinwheel. So a lot of us have pinwheels, just blowing it. Help us calm down. Um, this is one I had in my childhood. A uh, little stress squeeze guy, squeezing it, feeling it <laughs> to help. Don't start all of them. I might retire some items from the calm down basket. And you'll notice in this picture, two girls using it at once. Absolutely. Again, it's very natural. And, and you're going to say, well, are our students going to say that sweet Susie's in the calm down basket again? No, it's just very natural. And for my students that might stay there, welcome a little too long. Again, I'm going to use proximity, just put my hand there and say, are you doing okay? Can I help you with anything? And, and again, they just might need an extra second and they go back. And, and we go over a lot of parameters. Saying it's about five to ten seconds. It's there for you when you need it. You're going to calm down with it. Um, put it back and go back to your student work. I'm going to highlight maybe in a sharing session and reading workshop and writing workshop a student that used it went back and tried or went back and read once they used the calm down basket. So again, I'm highlighting my students that are using it um, appropriately and correctly to build kind of that independence and that automaticity in using it. Calm down baskets are super. So you might say, okay, I teach older grades. I totally see them playing with this. So what's another option for me? Calming corner. So in positive discipline, um, Jan Nelson talks about a quiet place and a classroom where children can go voluntarily to comfort themselves. And I want to, um, this is from the Momentous Institute, this picture. And I want to highlight here, this calm corner should be very minimal. It shouldn't have a ton of stuff in it. I probably would not put my calm down basket in there because I want students to sit and think. Um, here at the Hawkeye School, they're giving us great autonomy with how we, how we want to do it. And what I did with my calm down corner is I took emoji stickers, emoji movie just came out, ordered some nice little decals, put them on the cabinet that is by my calm down corner, and I put a happy one. I put a sad emoji. I put a uh, frustrated emoji. And I just added a simple beanbag, or if you have a yoga mat, maybe you want a clear frame. I put that in there. And again, they have a space where they can go to calm down. Um, maybe you don't have space for this in your classroom, so I would pick one. What you think would be more appropriate for your student? This one's lined with clouds. Again, you want to make it your own. So I'm not saying that you need to have a ton of books in there, you need to have a ton of pillows. I would just keep it very minimal. Um, those of you that may be like a more Montessori environment, you could maybe set up a small display. Maybe you have uh, just a small um, vase of flowers and they're smelling the flowers that they picked at recess as a, as a way to calm down. That is another alternative. Again, all calm down spaces are going to look different depending on who designed them and the learners in their class. So I don't want to say that it's a one size fits all model. It's going to be a calm down space. It might be a calm down corner. It might be a calm down beanbag chair. But we want to highlight that the students, again, that are using it correctly. Um, recently, our faculty had a ball with the calm down corner and so we made an adult um an adult one and i'm going to show you that here in just a second but the ultimate goal is for students to find a quiet place within themselves to really regulate themselves with this and so our adult version in the office of our calm corner is this one this is our candy jar and our peppermint jar is right beside it and um we have an adult calming corner here at the Huckabee school so if you're in dallas texas and want to visit um, just shoot me an email and you can check out our adults calming corner that has chocolates and um, have a nice quiet and sweet savory taste in our mouths um, we have different versions so again not a one-size-fits-all model make it to meet your own learners okay so at the Hockaday school here in Dallas Texas these are the values that we focus on in every um, 
school gathering for our lower school students. So our pre-K one is perseverance, our kindergarten one is friendship, our first grade one is honesty, and second grade respect, third grade empathy, and fourth grade responsibility. And, and we have taglines that the students repeat every gathering, and you, you might say, how often are you meeting for these gatherings or all school gatherings? We meet, we're on a six-day rotation, we meet once every six days, and it's built into our schedule. Um, we are very intentional with what we do in these gatherings, and our, we took our oldest grades, and they are our gathering leaders. We have two of, again, we, we ended fourth grade, so two of our fourth graders will get to lead our gatherings, and they work with a teacher, and teachers rotate having the gathering, and we might have faculty come and share things, um, whether it's on mindfulness or self-awareness. We might have um, a guest speaker come in. We could also have a parent share with us something. One that I really enjoyed is we do a Kids on the Block puppet series where we talk about building inclusion skills. So in our recent Kids on the Block puppet series, we talked about a student that had Down syndrome and it was done through the use of puppets and two faculty did the puppets, but we had them ask questions and they were phenomenal questions of, you know, are you born with Down syndrome or do you ever lose Down syndrome and what does that look like? And um, it's really impactful when you have students that have siblings that have Down syndrome come and share and offer them an opportunity if their sibling feels comfortable coming and sharing their story, they can. Again, it's all about utilizing what you have in your school and in your buildings. Um, I'm happy to share more about you, these core values, just let me know, but these are the ones that we really focus in on holiday. And again, even though pre-K is perseverance, you better believe I'm still talking about friendship, I'm still talking about honesty, I'm going to talk a little bit about empathy, respect, and responsibility. So these are all just really good core values for any learner to have. So um, what are some other ways that we can teach these skills? Again, I'm not adding anything in. I'm looking at what's in my schedule and how I can be deliberate in doing this. One of the companies I just adore with social and emotional learning is Peaceable Kingdoms. They are based out of California. If you have not checked them out, check them out. Um, I totally found them on a whim last year. I was creating homework bags, and homework bags are just opportunities to build responsibility for my pre-K students. I was like, what's well, a fun way I can do this? I don't want to send them home with paper homework. I want them to have experiences and opportunities, and I use Peaceable Kingdom to do that. I found them in Target, just shopping, and it's on cooperative play. And you're like, what's cooperative play? Cooperative play is where there is not one winner. It's either everybody wins or everyone you know, loses together, and they're working together on doing this. This game, Stack Up, is a phenomenal one about being courageous, not comfortably, and they, um, this game, and what I love is each game on Peaceable Kingdoms has a QR code, and you can actually go to YouTube if you don't have a QR code scanner, type in Peaceable Kingdoms Stack Up, there's a one minute, 15 second video on how to play the game. And I tell parents, you know, you can scan the QR code if your child forgets to play it when they bring it home in their homework bag. But we play this in class before we send it home. And we talk about after the students play it, what do you think you had to do once that tower fell? What did you have to do? We had to try again. Okay, what's that called? And so we have that conversation and that reflection with them. Um, in this game, students are working to use these wooden rods to stack these blocks in a tower. There are three levels to play on most Peaceful Kingdom games. And so one level has them use their hands. One level has them use the rods that have a little stick, and one level has them use rods with a skinnier part. And so you can see the rods here. One of them has a white piece, and one of them has a skinnier piece. And they're stacking those pieces. Um, the cards are for the third level, and so it might say, stand on one foot. It might say, close one eye. And you can see how excited these students are and how they are like, oh my gosh, can we do it? Can we really stack these blocks and work together? a great opportunity to do it. And we, we incorporate a lot of these games once we got stack up, we got count the chickens, and so they incorporate some academic skills as well, not just fine mode. But again, I'm gonna look for something that involves a lot of things, not just one skill. Again, we are so stretched for time as teachers. We have to be super, super smart on saying, I need a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a lot of this. So these Peaceable Kingdom games will say, you're focusing on, you know, fine motor, you're focusing on development, you're focusing on count the chickens, counting, so again, very good games on this. Um, one of the questions in ESGI was, what are some great books I can read to my students? I start every day in pre-K and every year I've been teaching with read alouds. Um, reading is my jam, my master's is in reading. And um, so I've gotta be really deliberate with the books that I choose to read aloud to students. 
first, I want these characters to look like my students. So I'm very deliberate in seeking out books that represent the students in my classroom. The second thing I do is I look for books, yes, that are funny and that capture the attention of my students, but also focus on these social and emotional goals that I, that I have for them or these introductions I want to make. So in this sweet book, Worm Builds, Worm builds a tower. You can see him working so diligently on that in that tower. And, and you turn the page very, it's, a, it's about a C reader book. Worm builds a tower. His friend Rat comes and walks into it with a stack of books. So Worm builds his tower again. And then his friend um, Rabbit comes on a skateboard and knocks it down. Worm builds his tower again. Somebody else comes um, and knocks it down. Again, not on purpose, on accident. But then on the last try, Worm uses glue. <laughs> so a very cute book, very simple book that you can use. Some books that just came out that I want to highlight that I absolutely adore. Jabbar Jumps. We read this at the beginning of the year. Jabbar is trying to jump off that diving board. How he must feel when he jumps off that diving board. And um, talk a little bit about empathy. Might introduce the word then too. But um, Jabbar tries many times. Gets up there, climbs down that ladder, just feels defeated. And he's like, I'm going to go back and do it again. Um, that, that was a great book. Just came out not too long ago, but my spring takeaway is a bike like Sergio's. If you have not checked out a bike like Sergio's, oh my gosh, my heart melts on this book. Um, a bike like Sergio's is just like it sounds. Um, the boy with the glasses wants a bike like Sergio's. And so he has to, um, you know, he lives, it's almost like a New York City setting where he's at his grocery store where he knows the people in his neighborhood. And so he's in line waiting for, to pay for the groceries. His mom has given him money to get exactly what they need, not what they want. And so he's going to get milk and bread. And um, the woman in front of him drops uh, what he thinks is a dollar bill. And he's, he doesn't catch up with her in time to give her the dollar bill back. And so he puts it in his pocket, walks home, gets home, gives the groceries to mom. You can see two children playing in, in his place where he gets home. But he gets in his bedroom and he opens that, that bill. And it's not a dollar bill. It's a hundred dollar bill. So now he's left with that moral dilemma of like, this isn't my money, but I want a bike like Sergio's. He even goes in a few pages after that initial discovery goes to the bike store with Sergio, sits on the bike that is exactly like Sergio's, and just sees himself on that bike. And so he has to say, do I get do I get a bike like Sergio's? I have the money. It's not my money. Or do I give the money back? So I heard I like really encourage you to definitely get a bike like Sergio's. Look into that. That is an amazing book. Um you can read that with older kids. It was a stretch to read it with pre-K. Probably read it a few times over multiple days. But I, I love just good children's lit. Um, the koala who could just came out. You know that was Scholastic Points. Talking about a koala who just keeps trying. And super excited with Come With Me. Hasn't come out yet. And she persisted. Just, again, incorporating those words. Again, a longer book like this for my younger learners. I'm going to read over a span of a few days. If you read books at your uh, snack time, if you read books at your end of the day, be very purposeful with them. And you're going to say, Allison, I don't have a ton of money. Your public library is your best resource. And I love my public library. Um, if you're in Dallas area or check even your local library, they might have this. They have an educator's account. Again, library card free. Educator's account let you have books longer and don't let you have a limit on the books you check out. What I love about my public library is I can go type in a bike like Sergio's, Jabara Jumps. I can put that book on hold. And when I go to the library, when it's in, it's already pulled for me in a special place. So I don't have to spend time trying to find the book, searching for it. I can go and just pick up those books that I need. And I often will do that when I have like 10 minutes. I'll just stop by my library, go to my hold shelf, pull out my books, check them out, and take them with me. If they're really good, I'll go to my school librarian who I just love. Shout out to my librarians that I've worked with. They are phenomenal. I have a great relationship with them. I'll say, we have to get this book. It is so good. And um, they oftentimes, if they have it in their budget, they will definitely do it for me. But your, your public library is just amazing. They have great resources. That is one field trip we do take um, at our students um, before the end of the school year, before summer starts, is what does the main library look like? And who can get library cards? If, if we can, and the parents sign off, grandparents, guardians sign off, we'll let the students get library cards. We, um, we have let them check out before, and I, I'll take those books back if I, if I let them check out. But um, 
libraries are great and they just open an endless, a endless, endless list of possibilities for our students. So definitely, and educators, definitely check out your public library if you have not, but your school librarians are phenomenal with, with helping you get those books that you need in some way, whether it's using your public library or your school library. So my morning meeting is, is great with this and I do this every day. This is something that we do at Hockaday and I know that a lot of teachers use this where we have a simple greeting, we do a share, we do a group activity and a news and announcement. There's just four parts and so a greeting might be a handshake, a high five, a sharing might be that I'm sharing what's going on that day or we have some show and tell. A group activity is where we're doing something together and news and announcements again might be what's going on that day or any new additions to our classroom. So what are some activities we do in this to build social and emotional skills? Um, this was one we did recently, and this is using spoons, plastic spoons, and a marble. I had to get the marble all the way around the circle. And I have my um, the other teacher in the classroom and I do this. And what is great is if uh, this year they were very good and the marble made it all the way around. So we were, we were intentional and we dropped it. And we sat and we reflected. How did you feel? Were you mad at us because we dropped it? Would you have been mad at a student if they dropped it? And so we have, we're very intentional with our reflections on this. Um, we do this game. I played at my grandmother's when I was growing up. It's called Blockhead. Um, we don't call anybody a blockhead. That's what we did at grandma's house. But there's one wooden piece on the bottom here. And we give each student a block. And they have to stack all their blocks on the one block. So you can see students covering their eyes, getting anxious, excited. Like, are we going to stack all of our blocks? or working together on a goal. And again, this might take us five morning meetings to get where we get all the blocks on. If I only have 16 students, I'm only giving out 16 blocks, and then I might build to 20 blocks. And I do a little bit more to make the challenge a little bit more interesting. You might say, well, I have blocks in my classroom. These blocks have different angles and edges, so it's hard to stack them. We might have them be architects or scientists and say, look, what, what block do you think would be best on the bottom? What do you know about other buildings? So we get them to utilize their schema with that. Um, so those are some activities we just do for our group, um, group activities and morning meeting. But Anything, and I love um, another one of my mentors, Kristen Zimke, amazing, in her book Amplify, she's talking about using digital skills. Be very intentional with your reflection, and it does not need to be a 30-minute reflection, and it's going to look differently. In pre-K, it's a lot of this. It's a lot of sit in the circle, let's talk about it together, and I have maybe two to three questions that I'm asking. In my older grades, if you want to talk that bridge class at the end of the year, we, we had a recording booth where students would, I've taught them how to mirror the camera, they're going to record, how did they feel when they did that challenging math problem, or how did they feel when that student did that to them? So the reflection is where it is at. How can we do this differently? What might this look like if we were to use the calm down basket? And it's going to be a lot of church quiet at first, and that's okay, but give it some wait time. This is where you're going to get your bang for your buck, is in the reflection. Um, Christy Mraz and the Mindset for Learning and her partner Christine Hertz word it perfectly. Risk, failure, and reflection are three legs of a tripod. Without any one of these elements, the tripod falls. Failure is an inherent risk, but through reflection, failure ceases to be an endpoint. Rather, it is a way station, a chance to take stock, examine the map, make a new plan, and move forward with more knowledge. We have got to teach these students how to do this reflection, how to make some changes and go on. Because I'm going to tell you right now, in their world and what we're dealing with, adaptability is the most important piece. And we've got to teach them how to adapt, how to make some changes, and how to move on. So I encourage you all to be a learner yourself in this journey on social and emotional learning. Um, Brene Brown in her book Rising Strong talks about rising strong, how we can be better once we get to that point where we're stuck. And her book that I'm currently reading that just came out is Braving the Wilderness. And that's about how we can stand alone. Um, for the next two days, I'm going to be at the Momentous Conference and their focus this year is hope, the ultimate four letter word talking about inclusion. And you can follow the hashtag changing the odds to see that. Um, that is an amazing organization. They do do tours of their school. You can see some fabulous ideas. They have a tactile wall. Um, it looks, um, they have some pre-K classes. They go all the way through fifth grade, I believe there, and just have some great conversations on social and emotional learning. But I started um, with this, and this is kind of their changing the odd speakers. Um, 
they have a great lineup this year, Nicholas Kristoff, who I just love, Half the Sky that he wrote, and some other authors, Thomas Alvarez, Brian Stevenson, but Momentus is very intentional with their families on working with this, what hope means to them. So you can see Angelina's family here. This was tweeted out earlier this week, and um, they, their families just work on building these social and emotional skills as they go through the Momentus Institute um, in Dallas, Texas, at their school. So I started with this quote with you. I'm going to leave you with this quote. You can choose courage or you can choose comfort, but you cannot have both. And that is from Dr. Brene Brown. I encourage all of you, I've said it a few times, choose to be courageous this year. Do something tomorrow in your classroom where you're doing something on social and emotional talk. Maybe you read aloud with social and emotional, and maybe you're even taking a big risk and doing some breathing work with it. Um, you're an amazing group of teachers, amazing group of educators. Start having these conversations and you're going to see your weight, worth, and gold. Um, thank you so much for attending. I'm going to turn it back over to ESGI and they're going to tell you about the phenomenal prizes that lie ahead. Thank you so much, Allison. We have been so inspired and the comments that we're getting, you're going to get to see as well, but people are very excited to get started tomorrow with your ideas. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let's do some prizes. If, you, if your name is called, would you please give us a little shout out in the uh, question area? Our first winner, Penny Kennedy. Penny, you are going to win one year of ESGI. Also, Yay, Mary Posa, Mary Posa, and right, Misty Morgan, Wanda right, Weaver, Misty. Wanda is the next one, <laughs> uh, and then Olivia Berestianos, Berestianos, if you're All with right, us, Olivia. give us a shout out there. So Penny Kennedy, Mary Posa, Misty Morgan, Wanda Weaver, and Olivia Berstianos. You are winners and we will make sure that you get an email with how to redeem your free ESGI. Okay, thanks so much again, Allison, for presenting this great information. If you'd like to hear more from Allison, you can find her on Twitter at Allison Hogan EDU. And don't forget to check your email in the next two days to find your certificate of participation, a link to this recording, and a link to Allison's PowerPoint. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, and we hope that you'll join us next month. Have a great evening, everyone.